Thank you for being here. Um, tonight's lecture series uh, event is the first of a series of lectures sponsored by the city of Raleigh. And we are calling the series Connect Raleigh. Peter travels the world inspiring people to show love for their cities. Peter was just here, I think, two or three years ago, and we heard such great uh, compliments and energy about his presentation. We wanted Peter to kick off this lecture series tonight. Peter is the author of For the Love of Cities, The Love Affair Between People and Their Places, and the follow-up book, Love Where You Live, Creating Emotionally Engaging places. Peter is the former president of Creative Tampa Bay, a grassroots community change organization. He is also co-founder of Creative Cities Summit, which brings citizens and practitioners together around the big idea of the city. Peter is a senior fellow with the Alliance of Innovation, an organ organization dedicated to improving the practice of local government. Please join me tonight in welcoming our first speaker in the Connect Raleigh Lecture Series, Peter Kajiyama. All right. So, I start with this question. Do you love your city? Yes. All right, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a cheap one. But yes, you, I'm sure you guys do love your city. I mean, you know, you're coming out to hear a guy who's written books about loving their city. So of course you guys love your city. And we'd like to believe that this notion of loving our city is actually fairly uh, commonly held. And certainly in this room that's true, and maybe amongst your friends and your family, the folks you hang out with, that's probably the case. But the sad truth is that not nearly enough of us actually love our cities. So it is on us, those of us who do love a place, we have to be the emotional standard bearers and carry that message of love out there and help our fellow citizens see and feel the city the way that we do. Because remember, emotions are contagious. You smile, I smile. You cry, I feel bad. When more people start saying they love Raleigh, more people are gonna see it, more people are gonna feel it, more people are going to believe it. And maybe we create the virtuous cycle, which is of course the antidote to the vicious cycle, where good things are compounding upon good things, and all of a sudden now people are gonna say, hey, have you been to Raleigh lately? Because yeah, there's something going on there, and you can literally feel it. Now unfortunately, as I said, most people's relationship with their city is not nearly as sort of deep and maybe as nuanced uh, as that. In fact, most people's relationship with their city can actually be summarized by one thing, and it's actually the pothole. Now, None of us like potholes, right? Um, you know, and we as citizens, we complain to the city about fixing potholes, and cities eventually get around to fixing them. Uh, and that is sort of the ongoing song and dance uh, between citizens and, and cities. I can tell you this, we fix every pothole in Raleigh, we fix every pothole in North Carolina. And you, the collective citizens, would yawn, stretch, and say, yeah, thanks, roads don't suck quite so bad. There's no love for fixing potholes. There is no emotional return on investment for fixing potholes. This is not to say we're gonna stop fixing the potholes, but I think we can agree that maybe we should aspire to something more. Now here's the tricky part. Citizens, most citizens, know to ask for uh, our, our leaders to fix the potholes. It's pretty obvious, there's a hole in the road, my car's gonna fall into it, right? But they don't necessarily know how to ask for other things. They don't necessarily know how to ask for beauty and art and great design. That is not in most people's lexicon. So we as people who do care about our city, who think about our city in a different way, we need to not only listen to what our folks are gonna ask for, and of course they're gonna ask for the most basic things. Hey, fix the potholes, make sure the police and fire service arrive when I actually need them. But at heart, we know they want something more. And after we've given it to them, they're gonna say, how the heck did I ever live without this? So, so as we're thinking about building this better city, you gotta meet some minimum threshold requirements to be a working city. To be a working city, you gotta be functional, you gotta be safe. Now, a few years ago, when city budgets all over the world got cut to the bone, there was this notion that says, you know what, money is awfully tight right now, so let's make it functionally, make it safe, we paint it battleship gray and kick it out the door, and that's good enough. No, I don't think so. I don't think even the most fiscally conservative tax hawks amongst us want to live in a merely functional, safe, and battleship gray community, okay? So what could we aspire to in our places? What should we aspire to in our places? Well, how about comfort? Why can't the city be comfortable? How about conviviality in the sense that our city actually helps facilitate bringing us together and connecting us with our fellow citizens? Why isn't our city interesting? Maybe even more appropriately, why isn't our city fun? 
Where's the fun is a perfectly legitimate question that we should be asking a whole heck of a lot more in the context of better placemaking. Now, I'm sure all of you have been involved in all kinds of projects, right, that have all kinds of requirements and specifications, right? When was the last time you ever saw fun as a stated articulated goal of any project you've ever worked on? Even a project which, by its very nature, say, should have been fun. Let's say a park or a playground, right? I mean, there's all kinds of environmental, structural, insurance requirements. Not one mention of the word fun. Why the heck not? Why not at least plant that seed and that hope and maybe that expectation of something beyond merely technically sufficient? So here's the challenge. The next time you find yourself in one of those meetings when you're there with your team, I don't care if it's, if it's in the public sector, private sector, wherever, inevitably we're going to get pulled into some meeting when we're down there in the weeds wrestling with some big hairy problem, right? Those meetings suck. Uh, but the next time you find yourself in that meeting, it'd be interesting if one of you would ask, raise your hand and ask the question, say, I see what we're doing here, but I've got to ask, where's the fun? Because when you ask that question, you change the dynamic in the room and the way people are fundamentally thinking about the problem. You'll ask, where's the fun? And someone might actually look up from their phone. And they might smile a little bit and go, yeah, where is the fun? And in that moment, you open up the door to the possibility of something beyond a merely technically sufficient solution. Where's the fun is a great question that we should continue to ask as we think about how do we make our city better? You know, we're very smart about uh, our cities. You know, that is kind of what the nature of this, you know, this lecture series is about. Well, I think the, the, opportunis the opportunity is in allowing other things to percolate up, emotions and fun. That is a legitimate goal in the work that we do, and let us not forget that as we move forward, thinking about how to make this city even better. Where's the fun? So the things that I write about uh, over and over again that people tell me about what they love about their places are oftentimes kind of small, kind of quirky, kind of intimate. And in my books, I liken them to the idea of the handwritten note that goes with the gift, a love note, if you will. And guys, we learned this lesson. At some point in our life, we gave a gift to our significant other, and we forgot to give a card or a note with that gift, right? That was a mistake, because that card, that note, meant something. It says we took a moment, we made it personal, we made it special, and that small thing had an outsized impact on the way they felt about the gift, by extension, the way they felt about us. Small thing, outsized impact. So these love notes are things that cities give to their citizens, and if cities are very lucky, citizens, like you, might actually feel inclined to give back to their cities as well. i got a few examples here for you. Um, the Lawn on D in Boston. So about three years ago, adjacent to the um, convention center in downtown Boston, they had about a three-acre empty space. And they're trying to figure out how to activate this space, for, kind of on a temporary basis. And what they came up with was, for lack of a better description, an adult playground. Right? So between May and June, they operate this adult playground. So they bring in the comfy Adirondack chairs, they bring in swings, but they don't bring in just any kind of swings, they bring in the adult size swings. Because again, why should kids have all the fun? And then they started to program the heck out of this space. So now there's all kinds, there's wine tastings, there's beer tastings, um, there's, there's music, there's, uh, there's jazz, there's, uh, there's Zumba, there's yoga, there's cornhole, there's giant Jenga. Do you know giant Jenga is a spectator sport, by the way? Because when that thing starts to tilt, you will stop and you will watch, right? So uh, again, they're programming the heck out of this space and creating this sort of sense of activity down there. And if you're a conventioneer there looking out the window going, oh man, that looks so much cooler than the tax accounting class I got to go to back here. But hopefully you find your way out of the convention center. And if you're a local, you love knowing that this stuff is happening in your city. Again, in the grand scheme of Boston, this is a pretty small thing. But you know, I, I think it will have a pretty big outsized impact on the way you feel about your city. Small thing, outsized impact. This is an interesting one, Auckland, New Zealand. Now, most of us, we know New Zealand because about 15 or so years ago, uh, they started making these movies, The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, right? So that's how we know New Zealand. And we look at this uh, photo and we go, oh, look, they actually have hobbits in New Zealand. Look at these tiny, tiny people up here. But no, what they actually have here are some very big outsized benches. And this goes back to that question is, why can't our city be comfortable? Well, most of the time, our cities can't be comfortable because we're deathly afraid that a small group of people might actually sit down or lie down on something and consequently, we make the entire city as uncomfortable as possible for the rest of us. Now, I think this is kind of silly, because there's other ways to deal with the homeless, there's other ways to deal with transients, and wouldn't it be cool to maybe take a moment to be able to relax, lie down, take in a great view, hang out with your friends, take in some sunshine? Yeah, that's pretty cool. Now, I think this also says something about uh, the leadership there uh, in Auckland. I think it says, you know what? We trust our citizens. We think they'll make good choices. So again, grand scheme of things, pretty small thing, but I'm pretty sure it will have an outsized impact on the way you feel about the experience, especially with a view like that. Um, and as far as love notes, I saw a few love notes uh, here today. Uh, these little parklets outside of Deco, uh, how wonderful is that? 
Now, there are some people who believe that every downtown parking space is sacred and thou shalt not touch those. Like, I think that's kind of BS. Because you know what? Park, you know, streets are not just for cars. Streets have to be about multiple kinds of things. And activating a street like this, it takes some of that back. Most of us feel like the street, it's all about cars. We don't even want to go close to them, right? Because it's dangerous, they're loud, they're noisy, you know, they smell bad. But when we do stuff like this, we remind people that you know what, it's not just about the car, that it is about us. And to me, again, very much a love note. Well done there. Um, and I saw this over in Glenwood. The, uh, there's a little poetry wall. So people write uh, poetry, chalk, and eh, there it's temporary. I think that's very cool, but a little bit of expression. Well done there. Uh, and then this one, you guys might remember this. Do you guys remember a few years ago over in Durham? A wedding. It was uh, March, I think, of 2012 was the first time they did it. Uh, about 1,600 people got up in front of their friends and neighbors, and they married the city of Durham. You guys remember this, Mary Durham? It was started by this one woman, and apparently the woman really loves Durham, and someone snarkily said to her, it's like, well, if you love it so much, why don't you marry it? Say, hey, good idea. Mary Durham is born. And the oath, when they did it, included, included things like a promise to keep the streets clean and safe, support local government, uh, vote responsibly, protect the environment, buy local. Very cool. What this really underscores to me is a very fundamental notion. So we're in a relationship with our places. We don't think about that very often. You know, we have these highly examined personal and professional relationships that we spend lots of time grinding on. When was the last time we stopped and thought about the relationship we have with our place? Probably not often, if ever. And an unexamined relationship, it can go stale. It can go bad. So again, this was a great reminder of the fact that we are in this relationship. Uh, with our places. And apparently it was a great excuse to have a party as well. Did any of you happen to go to any of that? No? Well, okay. Uh, there. Had any, a few folks, I'm curious, had any folks heard of this one? A couple. Wow, okay, interesting. Um, and murals are love notes. Uh, I took this photo uh, there today. Apparently some Disney princesses have kind of upped their game and are walking around uh, your city. I thought that's pretty cool. I love a good mural. Uh, this, and, and you know what? Murals don't actually always have to be on walls. I think that's kind of a misnomer. We tend to think about murals in sort of a one-dimensional kind of way. Very cool. And then this one, this is from uh, downtown St. Petersburg, Florida, where I live. Nikola Tesla. Gorgeous. Incredible. Now, I, uh, uh, I look at this mural, I appreciate it, but most of us, myself included, I can't paint. I don't have any artistic talent when it comes to something like this. So I look at it, I appreciate it, but there's what I would call an emotional distance between me and this mural. Again, I look at it, I appreciate it, but that's about the extent of it, right? And, you know, that's, I think most people would feel that way. Now, this was kind of interesting. In um, Ludington, Michigan, which is a little town on the west coast of Michigan. You know, folks from Michigan, they hold up their hands, say, where are you from? They point to it. Well, Ludington is like over here on the knuckle, right? On the west coast there, about halfway up uh, uh, the state. And they had this really ugly downtown wall. And like three summers ago, they hired an artist to come in and do sort of a paint-by-numbers outline on this wall. And then over one particular weekend, they invited the entire community to come down, grab a number, grab a bucket of paint, go paint your number. And the result was this. Now, as art goes, it's not high art, but it is highly interactive public art. It's the kind of public art people are going to point to and says, hey, you know what? I helped paint that. And we feel very differently about something we have had a hand in the making of. So maybe one of the things we got to be thinking about here as we're thinking about better cities is how do we allow more of our fellow citizens to roll up their sleeves and get a little dirty? Now, I know this makes you know, city attorneys and risk managers you know, a little bit nervous. It's like, okay, that's fine. But you know what? It's not their job to eliminate risk. It is their job to manage risk. And if other cities can figure out how to do this, we're, we're certainly smart enough to figure out how to do this uh, as well. And again, we have a very different relationship with something we have had a hand in the making of. Now, um, as, our, as, I, I, as art goes, I happen to notice this as well. And I thought, this is well done. I, I like these kinds of interactive sort of murals that invite you to become part of it. And you know what? This is the, the whole point of this is not necessarily the, the mural itself or the art itself. It's the photo op, right? Because when I put this up there, of course, you're going to tag it. You're going to send that out there. And that's kind of the point here. And have you seen stuff like this, like in Indianapolis? That's kind of interesting. Uh, there. Or uh, the Bronze Fawns in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That's kind of cool. By the way, uh, a lot of the arts folks, they don't like this kind of stuff. They think it's a little sort of, it's not, it's not necessarily high art again. But I think they're missing the point there. It's not about the art. It is about the photo op. It is about the interaction. It is about the memory that we make when we do something like this. It is that interaction that we have with it. It is public art. And as far as uh, photo ops go, I have to give props to the folks in New Zealand. Um, this is maybe the best one I've ever seen. Smog, it's in the, the Wellington Airport. Yeah, you will stop, you will take a lot of photos uh, there. And every one of those photos, definitely love notes. Well done there. 
Dog parks are love notes. Uh, with apologies to those of you who own cats and birds and fish and ferrets. You probably don't walk your cat. And if you do, people think you're a little odd, right? We walk our dogs. When we walk our dogs, we're actually out there using green space, interacting with each other, creating a sense of activity, right? And dog parks, dog parks are social. Dog parks are probably the most social places in the entire city. People talk to each other at the dog park. Now, they may not know your name, but they know your dog's name, right? And eventually, they'll get around to learning your name as well. And that's a little bit of social capital that didn't exist before. It's because the dogs have essentially negotiated that encounter and broken the ice for you. Very cool. Side benefit. In a time when we probably still can't afford more police and more surveillance equipment in our neighborhoods, um, the dogs and the dog owners provide a sense of safety. It's not because you have to own an attack dog or anything like that, no. But the fact is, is that we dog owners are out there all hours of the day and night walking our dogs, creating what Jane Jacobs, the great urbanist, called the eyes of strangers on the street. Nothing worse than walking down a completely empty street, right? We feel pretty exposed by that. But hey, if there's a dog and a dog walker out there, it's all good. So maybe there's some neighborhoods here we'd like to see get better. Maybe it's as simple as a, little, uh, as a little dog park. Maybe it's even simpler. It's one of those mitts in a stand and a place to throw the poop that basically says dogs are welcome here. It's amazing to me how dogs and cities humanize cities for the better. And I happen to notice there over at uh, Moore Square, uh, you guys are going to re be redoing this park. And to me, this is an opportunity. With all these people who are coming and living uh, in your downtown and all the people you want to come and live in your downtown, a few of them have dogs. Have you noticed? How about a little dog park uh, in here? Not only for you know, the, the, the benefit of all those people who want to live downtown, but how about creating a sort of sense, a gathering spot, a social place where, again, people talk to each other, creating social capital and a little bit of safety uh, as well. So I think this could be an opportunity for you guys. And by the way, uh, Dick's Park absolutely is, a, uh, uh, is an opportunity for you guys. It is a generational opportunity for you guys. I don't know if you guys fully appreciate this, because uh, they said a lot of folks tend to think about Dick's Park as like, oh, that's the mental hospital. And they're sort of like, oh, you know, we don't go there. But 300 acres proximate to downtown, my god, what can't you do uh, with something like that? This is going to be an amazing sort of generational project, I think, for you guys. And I heard some very cool stuff that is coming uh, here in the next few months, uh, some things that are going to light up the park, do some amazing things. Uh, and so this is a big, big love note. Uh, but still, uh, I think uh, this is going to be absolutely amazing. I'm very, very, very curious to see how this sort of plays out for you guys over the next few years. And by the way, we have a little love note challenge uh, here as well. And what's actually going to happen here is uh, we're actually announcing it. There's going to be some information. It's actually going to be announced for next week, I'm told. And we want you guys to share something that you love about Raleigh. Could be a photo, could be a little video, something uh, around that. There'll be the information will be posted here. So if you follow these, um, uh, these different uh, accounts, you'll get all the information. And I'm told there might actually be a little prize money or something uh, there at the end. So something where you will share something that you love about uh, this city. And I think that's kind of a wonderful thing. Because you know what? Somebody's going to post something and go, oh yeah, I love that too. Or it's like, hey, if anyone, if you guys ever noticed this, like, wow, that's amazing. So hopefully, this will give you an insight about your own city, a city maybe you've lived here for years. And if somebody can help you discover something new about a city you've lived in for years, that's a good day. And that's a, ab absolutely a lot of fun. So I, I, I hope you guys will sort of jump in and sort of share something that you do love uh, about Raleigh. Rituals and traditions are amazing love notes. Um, rituals and traditions. Families have them. Schools have them. Cities have some amazing ones as well. One of my absolute favorites comes from Providence, Rhode Island. And this is called Water Fire. This was started about 25 years ago by an artist by the name of Barnaby Evans. Uh, so about 25 years ago, um, Providence was a city that was trying to reconnect with its river. And what Barnaby did was actually kind of amazing, because this river sort of snakes through the heart of this downtown, and it empties into this round lake right in the heart of downtown. So what Barnaby did was really very simple. He brought in these braziers, they anchored them in the middle of the river, they bring in cords of pine wood, and they light them on fire. It's water and fire. It is the most basic thing in the world, and it is absolutely magical. Because you go down there during a water fire event, you smell that pine smoke, hear the crackle of that wood, and see these great dancing shadows that are created all over the city, because it's essentially like a giant bonfire on the river, right? And all of us, we have sat in front of a campfire or a bonfire and been absolutely mesmerized by the experience, right? There's something about he, our, our, uh, us as humans that we can sit and watch fire and be incredibly content. Well, imagine taking that experience to a municipal level and you have water fire. And a few years ago, I was lucky enough to participate in what they call a lighting ceremony. 
And sort of like the villagers from a Frankenstein movie, we carried these torches from City Hall down to the riverfront. We put the torches into this urn, and from the urn, we lit water fire. Very cool. This will always inform the way I think and feel about Providence, and definitely one of my favorite rituals and traditions. This is an interesting one. Shelburne Falls in western Massachusetts. And this is the Iron Bridge. Now, the Iron Bridge has cars and trucks. And 364 days out of the year, cars and trucks go back and forth across this bridge. But for one day out of the, uh, the year, for the last dozen years or so, it's been in August. They close down the bridge, and they have dinner on it. Uh, local restaurants cater to the event. Students are the waiters and waitresses. They bring out the linen tablecloths, the linen napkins. Um, and it's a giant fundraiser for the Chamber of Commerce. And tickets go like that when they go on sale. Now, you may go across this bridge every day, going to and from work, to and from school, right? But I guarantee you, having dinner on the bridge will make you see and feel the bridge differently and make you see and feel your city differently as well. Very cool. And it sort of begs the question, what could we have dinner on here in Raleigh? What could we have brunch on here in Raleigh that might help people see and feel and experience their city in a different way? This is a really good idea. It's really simple, and you absolutely should steal it. And if you do, let me know. I'm very curious to see what you guys might actually uh, do with that, how to make this sort of uniquely your own. And I did get a hint of something that possibly involves uh, Dick's Park. Just saying, be on the lookout for maybe something interesting uh, along those lines. But again, seeing and feeling your city in a different way, absolutely. Very, very cool. And as far as like rituals and traditions go, I understand the Krispy Kreme Challenge actually uh, you know, has its origins here. I mean, how many folks have done the Krispy Kreme Challenge? A few. Did anybody, well, I won't ask if you threw up because that's a little gross. But apparently, that is a big part of the Krispy Kreme Challenge. Do you guys know what the Krispy Kreme Challenge is? 12 donuts, tw four miles, sounds easy. I mean, yeah, somebody's like, you mean I can eat 12 you know, Krispy Kreme donuts? I love Krispy Kreme donuts, yeah. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. But again, it's, a, it's an interesting ritual and tradition that again, uniquely yours, but I guess it has spread to a lot of other cities as well, but you own it. This was the one, this was an original uh, here in Raleigh, so well done there. So you know, you're, you're creating sort of, you're, you're placemakers as well as donut eaters. So that's well done, so. Now, this one is very cool, uh, Walk Raleigh. And I was told Matt Tomasula might actually have been here tonight. Anybody seen Matt tonight? Well, if you see, if you know, is that Matt? Hey, there we go. <laughs> Matt and I have never met. We actually spoke a few years ago when I interviewed him by phone about this project. So, okay, you guys remember Walk Raleigh. Started in January 2012, and he spent a weekend hanging up a bunch of signs all throughout the downtown core, right? Now, what was interesting about these signs, which they weren't about cars and traffic, which is usually what you know, signs are about, but they were about people and walking. And he told me the whole idea behind this was to get people to consider the option of walking. Because let's face it, we will reflexively get in our cars even to go just a few blocks, right? But hey, if you knew it was only a 10 minute walk, seven minute walk, you know, it's like, hey, yeah, it's a good day. So, you know, weather's good. Yeah, my doctor says I need to get more exercise. Hey, my Fitbit's saying I need to get more steps. Yeah, let's go for a walk, awesome. Right? So again, uh, all kinds of positive press coverage around this. I mean, you guys actually do have a very walkable city. And um, I guess a BBC, BBC film crew even showed up because they'd heard Americans had discovered walking in cities. Like, hey, well done. And apparently, someone pointed out, it's like, excuse me, it, it appears that nobody had permission to put up these signs. Like, oh, yeah. So I guess technically, they, you, they, they did have to pull down the signs. But fortunately, your former planning director, uh, Mitchell Silver, was a big fan of the signs, along with many of you. And they brought the signs back under the auspices of a pilot project. Well done there. But this project really underscores a very fundamental fact. And maybe Matt can, uh, uh, you know, can explain this a little bit more in detail. But um, it, it, it begs the question to me uh, that sometimes somebody's got to break the rules to get us to the place we know we actually want to be. Now, I'm a lawyer by training. One of the things I remember from law school is there's the letter of the law and there's the spirit of the law. And in between the two, there's a tension. And in that tension, the law evolves. Well, of course, you know, in our, our cities, there's the, the rules, the code, and the regulations, but, right? but then there's also the goal. And the goal should be a better, more interesting, more lovable city. Well, sometimes our rules and regulations don't allow us to get there, or they don't allow us to get there in the most expeditious way possible. And sometimes you need somebody who's willing to step outside the system to help unjam the system to, again, get us the place we know we actually want to be. Now, I talk a lot of times to like mayors and city council and you know, city administrators and managers and stuff like that. And I get that maybe it's not the best thing for the mayor to be seen as that rule breaker, right? Because if somebody says, well, if the mayor's breaking that rule, I wonder what other rules the mayor is breaking. And who wants to invite that kind of scrutiny? I totally get that. So I tell those folks, they say, hey, look, if you're not that person who can you know, be that rule breaker and risk taker, then you know what? Have the backs of those who do. Because when they're doing something like this, they're absolutely advancing the cause in your city. Now, if Matt was in the sign selling business, 
this would have been received very differently. But he wasn't. He's not. He's trying to do something positive for his community, move a conversation along, and do something interesting, and, and make the, the city even more lovable. Well done there. Now, you know who are really good rule breakers and risk takers? Young people and artists. Young people will run through that metaphorical wall and leave a person-sized outline as they go through it, and that is a beautiful thing, right? Most of us, we're a little older, we've run through enough walls. Uh, we know it hurts, and we're a little reluctant to do it anymore. But God bless those young people. They have that energy, that enthusiasm. Go. And artists, artists will take on authority just because they're artists uh, as well. And i got kind of a fun example here for you. So in um, Grand Rapids, Michigan, there's this event called Art Prize. It's a juried art show that's been going on for almost 10 years now. And so a few years ago, uh, an artist came to the Art Prize folks and says, hey, um, I want to do these Chinese lanterns for Art Prize. And someone says, well, you know that involves fire, right? He says, yeah, yeah, don't worry. And they showed him the design, which is actually very clever in terms of how it prevented fire. And he says, and don't worry, we're only going to do 2,000 of them. Oh, well, that sounds reasonable. They went to the city. City looked at the design, says 2,000, sure, great. They went to the fire marshal. Fire marshal looked at the design, okay, very clever, 2,000, great. Everybody signs off, yay. Well, the actual night of the event, the artists showed up and they launched 20,000 of these lanterns, right? <laughs> And amazing. You know, 2,000 would have been beautiful. 20,000 is spectacular. And by all accounts, is one of the most memorable nights in recent Grand Rapids history. So I had a chance to talk with some of the leadership there in Grand Rapids, and I asked them about this. They said, well, officially, we might not do it again. They said, at the very least, we'd ask some different questions. Fair enough. But privately, they said, I'm so, it was amazing. I'm so glad it actually happened. Very cool. By the way, no fires. 2,000 was a bit beautiful, 20,000 is spectacular. And again, it took somebody having to break the rules to get us the place we know we actually want to be. So well done, Matt, keep breaking some rules. I hope you're out there doing some very cool stuff there. Yeah. <laughs> Millennium Park in Chicago is a big love note, is a very expensive love note. How many folks have been to Millennium Park in Chicago? Yeah, it's kind of amazing, right? This is called CloudGate. And the first time you approach CloudGate, you're going to do this. You're going to find your reflection. You're going to take your picture. Selfie. Click. You'll take your friend's picture. You'll take this skyline picture, right? And while you're doing that, you're seeing lots of people coming up and touching the art. Art you can touch. That's kind of crazy. And they're sort of playing with it like a giant funhouse mirror. And that's essentially what it is, right? And as you looked over your shoulder, you saw these, right? Those two water towers. And the water towers are covered in video screens, right? So these eyes will open. It will smile at you. And then during the summer months, they have these water cannons that shoot water out onto the deck, creating what is essentially a giant above-ground pool. And on a typical summer day, you will see hundreds of kids playing in that pool. Now, city-making point number one that we'd all do very well to remember is when kids are happy, parents are happy, right? We know this. We feel this. And kids love these water features. Cities, eh, not so much. Because they're kind of expensive, they always break down, and those darling children will sometimes do unspeakable things in there and somebody has to clean that stuff up. I don't have a solution to that last bit, but I did take this picture in a little town outside of Pittsburgh. This is Braddock, Pennsylvania. It's about five summers ago, hot summer day, little downtown park, kids are playing, and here in the corner, that is a garden hose. Now, I believe we have a tendency to overthink the solutions to our city's problems, right? Because you know what? The city manager's handbook says, oh, you want a splash pad? You want a water feature? Well, it costs this much money. It's like, um, I don't have that much money. It's, well, you know, we'll try to find the budget next year. Meantime, too bad, so sad. Well, what's wrong with going down to Home Depot, spending 20 bucks, buying a garden hose, and turning on the faucet? Nothing. In fact, there's everything right with that kind of solution. It says, hey, we're being financially responsible. We're being creative. And most importantly, we're responding to the wants and needs of our community. Cool. Yet too often, I hear cities almost apologize for their garden hose solution. It says, you know what? Well, we wanted to do this. Budget was tight, so we had to do that. No, you should be saying, you know what? We wanted to do this. Budget was tight. <coughs> we were able to do this. And you should be trumpeting this as a triumph over adversity, which is exactly what it is. Never apologize for your garden hose solutions. They show you at your very best. Again, being financially responsible, um, creative, and, re and ultimately responsive to the wants and needs of your community. So. The next time you find yourself in that situation where you don't have all the budget that you'd like, let's face it, when do we ever have as much budget as we'd like? Ask ourselves the question, what's the garden hose solution that, again, gets us down the road and allows us to respond to all the wants and needs of our community? Garden hose solutions. I'm going to get a sip of water here for a second. Thank you, folks. Hmm. Ah, thank you. All right. Moving on. Play. Play is important. Um, you know, if we're in this relationship with our cities, we need opportunities to play with our cities because I think play is sort of central to our relationships with other people. 
Think about those unstructured, unplanned moments when you're hanging out with your friends and family at play. They're the bedrock of those relationships. So again, we need opportunities to play with our cities. And I think public art is one of those great ways where play can actually happen. So my partner Michelle and I were in Anchorage, Alaska. This would be about five years ago, February. And we found this little downtown park. And these were sort of the remnants of their holiday ice sculptures there in, in uh, Anchorage. Obviously, February in Anchorage is still quite cold, right? So these were in very good shape. And we found these kids playing there. And Michelle goes and sits down on the caboose over here. And this little girl in yellow walked over and goes, hey, you're in my spot. So we had to move. And when we move, we find this. <laughs> OK, so city making point number two. It is really cool. You want people to make that face in your city. When people make that face in your city, good things are going to happen in your city. Not only are we going to go back and tell folks, hey, we had a great time in Anchorage, Alaska. We're going to put, put up all kinds of fun stuff on social media, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We're going to write some positive Yelp reviews. We're going to be in a good mood, and we're probably going to spend some money. And people don't make that face in your city when you fix potholes for them. No. They make that face in your city when you surprise and delight them. Surprise and delight, like fun, don't have to cost a whole lot of money, but they do need to be seen as legitimate objectives in the work that we do. Now, think about that. All of you have customers, clients, you know, uh, uh, you know, somebody that you are sort of responsive to. When was the last time you went into work with the goal of surprising and delighting your customers, your clients, your fellow citizens? Probably not often, but that's a good day to go to work. Can you imagine if the mayor went into the office uh, tomorrow and she said, hey, today I shall surprise and delight uh, the, the citizens uh, of Raleigh. It's like, that's a good day to go to work. And again, doesn't have to cost a whole lot of money. You know what she's sitting in? Frozen water. Frozen water, some creativity, some imagination, and thinking about the problem in a different way. Now, granted, frozen water is easier to come by in Anchorage, Alaska than it is in Florida, where we live. Nonetheless, there is always something lying around that if you thought about it in a different way, you might come up with some wildly fun and creative stuff if you had a different goal and a different mindset going in. Surprise and delight. And what would it look like maybe if a city embraced this idea of surprise and delight? Well, you might know a little bit about this city. It might be Greenville, South Carolina. Now, Greenville makes the argument that they're the best downtown in America, and they make a pretty strong case for it. How many folks have visited Greenville, South Carolina? It's a lovely place. This is their main street. Fantastic tree canopy, both sides of the street, all kinds of local restaurants, local shops, and you know at the far end of this road, there's this amazing waterfall with this park, uh, Falls Park, and this uh, sensational uh, footbridge that goes across it. It is an architectural marvel. This place is so good, other cities go there to study it. Yet amidst all this incredibly well done big stuff, and by big stuff I do mean expensive stuff, the thing that surprised and delighted me, uh, the, and the story I relate to folks like you, is actually something very, very small. It's actually the mice on Maine. These little brass mice, and the story goes about 14, 15 years ago, a high school student came into the mayor's office with this idea. He says, hey, Mr. Mayor, I want to do this scavenger hunt downtown. I want to cast these little brass mice. I want to put them downtown on Main Street and encourage people to sort of go and explore the city as they look for the mice. The mayor said, interesting. How much money do you need? The kid said, like, $1,200. And you bet for $1,200, the mayor said, sold. So now they cast the mice and put them downtown. And you'll see people now walking around downtown with these maps. And they get the maps in the restaurants and shops. It says, OK, come to this particular street corner, turn 45 degrees, look up. Boom. And you'll hear kids, women, and grown men squealing with delight once they found one of these mice. And after you've found one of these mice, you're looking everywhere for these damn things. It's like, oh, there's another one. And you find yourself looking at stuff you probably otherwise would not have even bothered to look at. And the mice, they're all very cute. They've all been given names. They've all been given a backstory. And it's all been collected in this really cool children's book called The Mice on Main. Wow. So again, amidst all this incredibly well done, big, expensive stuff, my lasting memory of this place, and I'm certain I'm not alone in this, <clears throat> is actually something this small. So yes, these little touches absolutely do make a difference. And again, it doesn't have to cost a whole lot of money. I do recognize, however, sometimes we got to go big. The Denver Convention Center. This is a piece of public art called I See What You Mean, but of course locally, <coughs> excuse me, it's known as the Big Blue Bear. Now, the Big Blue Bear is about 14, 15 years old now, and has become a very beloved piece of public art. But that wasn't necessarily always the case. And can you imagine the first time that artist came into city council with that idea? Said, hey, I got an idea. I want to do this statue. It's going to be of a bear. It's going to be really, really big. And oh, by the way, it's going to be blue. I suppose that conversation goes over the first time the powers would be here that. Uh, seriously? Do you know how many potholes we could fix for the cost of that ridiculous bear? 
And therein lies your challenge. Yes, the bear has a cost. And if you're one of those people who sees the world through that lens, if everything is about the purely financial accounting of things, the cost of things, you can always justify not doing something by saying, you know what, we'd always fix more potholes, which again is technically true. But in addition to having a cost, the bear has a value. And to me, the value of the big blue bear is once you've seen the big blue bear, you cannot unsee the big blue bear. You will always remember it, and you will always associate it with Denver. And people take a ton of photographs of this thing. And every one of those photos that goes out there is a smile, is a postcard, is a love note from the city of Denver. That absolutely has value. You know, there's lots of people who want to hold our city's feet to the fire, our elected officials, the official folks, uh, their feet to the fire about the cost of things. The cost, the cost, the cost. Well, it seems like those people who know the cost of everything, they don't seem to understand the value of anything. Because things, again, have a value beyond the purely financial. And if we want to live in the type of city that has room for things like beauty, art, great design, and big blue bears, well, we need to speak up about this stuff. We need to fight for this kind of stuff. This is an argument we can absolutely win. So fine, next time we want to have this conversation, sure, let's talk about the cost. Then let's also talk about the value. And again, things have a value beyond the purely financial. And if folks really want to get snippy about this stuff, let's talk about the cost of ugly. Let's talk about the cost of boring. Because you bet those things have a cost. But most folks have never thought about it in those particular terms. We can win this argument. We need to win this argument if we want to build the types of cities that not only work and are functional and safe, but actually engage us on a whole other level. And I had to say a little bit of sad news here. I, I just learned about this about a month or so ago. Lawrence Argent, the, um, the, the artist uh, behind uh, The Big Blue Bear, passed away uh, just about a month and a half ago. Very sad. He was kind of famous for these, they called a uh, master of whimsy, which I think is kind of wonderful. And he was, had this fondness for big animals. There's a giant jackrabbit in the Sacramento airport. This is a giant panda on the side of a building in China, of course. So uh, yeah, uh, kind of sad there. So sorry to bring that down. But I want to give a shout uh, out about that, because again, this guy was kind of amazing. The ultimate, though, in terms of lovable cities are, of course, people. They're the people who are desperately, passionately in love with their cities, the ones who go above and beyond ordinary levels of citizenship and will sometimes do extraordinary things for their places not because they're paid to, but because this is how they roll. This is how their sense of creativity, their sense of community manifests in some amazing ways. I call these folks the co-creators because they're essentially co-creating the experience of the city along with the official folks. You know, mayors and council and uh, city designers and architects and planners, it is their job to create the content that is our cities. Well, then there are these other folks, the ones who aren't paid to do it, but this is how they roll and this is how they make these amazing contributions to our places. These folks are really important. This is Bob Devin Jones. He is the creative director of a small black box theater in downtown St. Petersburg, where I live. And for those of us who live in St. Pete, we know how important Bob is to making St. Pete a great place to live, work, and play. But Bob doesn't show up on any city org chart. He's not one of the most powerful, most influential business people. No, none of that. But again, those of us who live uh, in St. Pete, we know how important Bob is to our community. Now, all of you know Raleigh's version of Bob Devin Jones. Many of you actually are Raleigh's versions of Bob Devin Jones, and that is awesome. But because we know you and we see you around town, I run into Bob at the coffee shop, there's still this notion that says, ah, oh, you know, that's just Bob being Bob. No, I gotta tell you, Bob being Bob is extraordinary, and we need more of that. Because Bob does not see the problem the same way that the official folks do. And consequently, his solutions are gonna be very different than the ones the official folks are going to come up with. And we need that, right? Cities, we get the big stuff mostly right. We're very smart about our cities. The real opportunity lies when more of us who don't see the problem in the same way, who don't come at it from some sort of traditional uh, approach, we look at the problem and say, hey, what if we did this, right? When Matt was figuring out how to do Walk Raleigh, I don't know if he was trying to uh, you know, rewrite the canon around you know, walking in cities. Probably not. Maybe he was. I, I'll, I'll, we'll, t I'll, we'll, t we'll chat. But I'm kind of, you know, I think it's like, hey, this would be cool. Let's see what, let's do this. And you know, who knows where this has rippled. And now, you know, uh, Walk Your City is now, I see this stuff all over the world now. So well done on you for taking a really good idea and people going, that's awesome. We should do that in our city. Yes, you should. So you never know what these little ideas from some of you might actually take root all around the world. These folks absolutely matter. Candy Chang, artist from New Orleans. And after Hurricane Katrina, she did a number of amazing projects. Um, I think one of my favorites though is probably the simplest one that she actually did. She made this stencil that says, it's good to be here. And she used spray chalk, not spray paint. She started spray chalking that message all over New Orleans. Now think about that message, it's good to be here, in the context of New Orleans, a city that people thought they had lost. It's like, wow, it is good to be here. 
And when you started seeing that message over and over and over again, that is powerful. That is important. You know, cities will spend lots of money on internal branding campaigns and self-confidence campaigns, and that's good. That's money well spent. But sometimes you get lucky. Along comes somebody who loves their city. In a really simple, beautiful, and eloquent way, does something so wonderful you could almost weep. It's good to be here. And what did that cost? Maybe 50 bucks, a stencil, a can of spray chalk. You know, most of our organizations, we can't open up a computer file on a project for $50, let alone actually delivering something. So how cool would it be if we could deliver something like that along with this other big stuff that we're actually working on? That top-down stuff and this bottom-up stuff happening, meets in the middle, that's when things get really, really interesting. This next one's kind of fun because I don't think anybody ever got permission to do it. It's a little anarchic. It's certainly surprising, delightful, but check this out. Can we bring up the sound just a little bit? There you go. My name is Peregrine Church. I make things that make the world a more interesting place, like a rainwork. Rainworks are pieces of street art that only appear when they're wet, and they're messages or images designed to make people's rainy day a little bit better. Seattle is associated with rain, it's fair to say, and rainworks just all it needs to be is wet, so it's sort of the ideal Seattle art. So the stuff that makes Rainworks is biodegradable, environmentally friendly, and completely non-toxic. The essential ingredient when making Rainworks is a super hydrophobic coating. Okay, let's see how it works on the never wetted pants and shirt. <laughs> so you want your start on the shirt, all right? That is a chemical that when you put it on a surface, will prevent that surface from getting wet. What? <laughs> what? I was just browsing the internet one day and stumbled across a viral video and the video showed like these really vivid images of like red wine pouring off a white shirt and chocolate syrup pouring off white shoes and people getting buckets of water thrown on them and they're like totally fine. And I'm like, whoa, that's super cool. What can I do with this? It's a spray on substance, so it made sense. It's like, what if you sprayed it through a stencil? So if you put it on concrete, well, ideally it'd be invisible. Instead of the concrete getting dark, the water will just roll right off it and it'll stay light colored. The contrast can be used to create an image. The very first one I did said, stay dry out there. And had a bunch of raindrops falling it. It was on a bus stop. And now there's about 25 to 30 rainworks out there. There's a lily pad and pond with frogs hopping between them in Ballard. There's I Heart Rain in UW. At 4th and Bell it says, worry is a misuse of the imagination. There's today's weather, rain, in Fremont. There's proud to be rainy in Capitol Hill. There is hopscotch at the junction in West Seattle. And we want to make way more. I mean, it's gonna rain no matter what, so why not do something cool with it? So how fun is that? Now, I bet if we went over and talked with the city's public works guys and asked them about this stuff, they go, oh yeah, super hydrophobic coating? We've known about that for years. But they never thought to do something like that with it. So again, that is the genius that we bring to the table when we look at the problem in a different way and come up with something very different than what the powers that be might actually do. So these co-creators absolutely do matter. And maybe the right co-creator comes along at the right time in the right place with the right problem, and you might actually have a game changer for your community. And that's exactly what happened in Grand Rapids, Michigan. In January 2011, Newsweek magazine published a list that no city in America wanted to be on. It was a list of America's 10 most dying cities. It was based upon population loss between 2000 and 2010, and Grand Rapids ends up on that list. Now, if somebody says something bad about our city, what's our typical response? It's like, oh, let's call the, uh, the marketing folks, get the PR agency working, get the word out. We are not a dying city. Remember 2011, money's awfully tight for most cities. And Grand Rapids didn't have any extra money lying around for a new ad campaign. It says, okay, what are we going to do? We're going to live with this moniker of being a dying city? So in walks uh, the guy in the green t-shirt. His name is Rob Bliss. He's 22 years old at the time, and he did social media for one of the local TV stations. So he comes into the powers that be and says, hey, I got an idea. We should do a lip dub. I'm sure somebody said a lip what? Because a lip dub. It's lip syncing to a popular song. We could do a Raleigh lip dub here right now. We could bring up the lights, put on some music. I'll get out my iPhone. We'll turn on the video. You guys start lip syncing, lip syncing, lip syncing. Tim, you get the solo at the end because I know he can actually sing. Lip dub. 
Might be a little on the nose, might be a little boring, but it lipped up nonetheless. Rob said, no, let's make it big, we'll make it epic. We'll shoot it downtown, we'll get everybody involved, we'll use YouTube and Facebook and Twitter, it'll go viral, it'll be epic, it'll be great. I suppose that conversation went over the first time the powers to be heard that. Uh, lip what? Using you who? Facebook, Twitter, don't know about that. Um, viral sounds bad. Um, by the way, son, how old are you? And have you ever done this before? Because let's face it, Rob does not look like your traditional city solutions provider. He's not wearing a suit, he's not wearing a tie, and more importantly, he doesn't have a stack of reports that say, hey, if we do this, we have these very predictable outcomes on the other end. No, none of that. He's 22 years old, he's got an idea and an enthusiasm, and he thinks he can pull it off. Now, maybe because they saw something in Rob, maybe because they had to. I suspect it was actually a combination of both. The city did decide to move forward. It says, look, we really don't have any extra money, but we can provide police and fire service for you, we can close off some roads for you, and we can help connect you with some private money. And they did. And in May of 2011, they shot the Grand Rapids Lipped Up. Now, it is this amazing community response being declared a dying city. The whole thing is like nine and a half minutes long. I've got a little excerpt I'm going to show you. But the key thing to remember about this is that it involves over 5,000 people. It takes place over a one-mile circuit all throughout downtown Grand Rapids, and it is shot as one continuous video take. Check this out. Remember, everything is cooler with pyro no matter what the fire marshal says. They said they picked this song because it's about life, death, and renewal. And I think it's because most of us know the words, right? At least of the chorus. It's interesting, they did five takes of this, and the fifth and final take was the one that they ended up using. Here comes the payoff. That video has been viewed over 5 million times on YouTube. That story got picked up by national and international media. Rob was interviewed on Good Morning America, and Grand Rapids got tens of millions of dollars worth of positive brand exposure because they're willing to listen to a 22-year-old kid who had a weird, wacky, untested idea. What's the lesson for you guys? Probably not to go out and do another lip dub. It's been done. It's been done really, really well. But in the spirit of the lip dub, let's recognize that the solutions to some of our problems may not look like any solution we have ever seen before. Nowhere in the city manager's handbook is there a page on lip dubs. No. And let's also recognize that the solutions providers may not look like the ones we're used to dealing with. They could be younger. They could be older. They could have you know, the hats on sideways, the pants down to here, the piercings, the tattoos, and those freaky earlobes go all the way down to here. And we as the adults in the room need to be OK with that. Because it would have been a real shame if the powers that be had said to Rob, eh, thanks, Mr. Bliss, we'll go talk to the marketing folks. We'll be fine. I don't know. I don't think we'll ever really know. But I suspect the real outcome of that is Rob probably would have said, you know what, the heck with this. I will take my talents elsewhere. And that would have been a real loss for the city of Grand Rapids. Because Rob doesn't just show up to do the lip dub. No, he actually had a little track record, a little history uh, with the city. In fact, his earliest project with the city, he organized pillow fights in the park uh, with the city which led him to doing this giant water slide in the heart of downtown uh, Grand Rapids, which led him to the art prize competition for which they made 100,000 paper airplanes, and they threw them off the roof of the tallest building in downtown Grand Rapids while the symphony orchestra played below. And that sets him up perfectly to be a hero for his community with the Grand Rapids lip dub. But can you imagine the first time somebody, you know, Rob comes into the permitting department, slides that permit across the table, okay, what can I help you today, son? Permit, please. Okay, what are we doing? Pillow fights in the park, please. 
pill fights in the park, why do I want to do that? Or pill fights in the park, uh, what kind of city do you think we are, son? But they didn't. So a little, pill fights in the park, sure, cool, fine, go have fun. And they did. Rob and his friends went and had some fun. They got some experiences. Hey, that was cool. Let's do something else. And they iterated. And two or three iterations down the road, they had a game changer for their community because somebody didn't step on that weird little project early on when they had the opportunity. That notion of citizens wanting to do something positive for their city is a precious, precious thing. And we as the powers that be need to do everything we can to not squelch that enthusiasm. And most of the time, cities don't squelch it out of any sort of sense of animus or anything like that. No, but you know what? We're the city. We're the bureaucracy. We're kind of big. We're kind of clumsy. And if something doesn't fit neatly into some bucket that we're familiar with, our reflexive answer is no. I'll tell you what. No is a lazy answer, right? So think about that. All of us may sit in some decision-making capacity at some point you know, in regards to our city, our neighborhood, something. And maybe the next time you're in that position and you're listening to somebody and, man, uh, they're, they don't have all the polish, they don't have all the language, but they're super excited about something. You might remember, hey, that guy Peter was talking about this. Say, so, hey, you know what? I'm not quite sure what you're on about. Let's go chat in my office. We'll figure out if maybe we can maybe, uh, make a way uh, for this to, to happen. He says, again, that notion when citizens like you want to step up and do something positive for their community, for their neighborhood, for their city, that is a great moment, and that is something that we need more of. We need more people uh, like you guys, the co-creators. We need more folks like Bob Devin and Rob and Matt to get in the game and become part of the solution. You know, these folks, they're like the spice in what makes a great dish. You don't have to have a lot of spice to make for a flavorful dish, but you got to have some otherwise bland dish. Well, every community needs some spicy people uh, as well. And I suspect we have some spicy people here uh, in the audience here tonight. We need these folks. As again, I said, cities are very smart, and we get the big stuff mostly right. The opportunity, the real interesting stuff that happens is when more of us decide to get in the game and become part of the solution. Too many of our fellow citizens believe city making is somebody else's job. They think it's too big. It's all about roads and bridges and schools. And they look at that and go, I can't do any of that. And consequently, they sit back and they wait for somebody else to make the city better for them. Now, as hardworking as our cities are for, for the most part, that's a long way. And I don't think most of us are that patient anymore. It's like, no, you know what? We could do something. Let's start small. You know, city making can not only, it's all obviously the big stuff, but you know what? It can also be a, a little community garden, uh, a, a dog park, a weirdo backyard festival that involves you, me, and our crazy neighbor that we do for no other reason than it amuses us. That stuff has value, and that is important. And hopefully, I think what, you know, some of the, the inspiration for this um, uh, speaker series is to get more people thinking about what could we do uh, about our cities. Of course, they want to make you smarter, but hopefully they want to inspire you to say, you know what, I'm going to do this, or I'm gonna, I want to join this. Let's figure out how we do this together. I suspect there's all kinds of projects uh, that are just you know, in this room alone. That if we started adding those things up, this, then things get really, really kind of amazing uh, kind of quickly as well. And again, it doesn't have to cost a whole lot of money. You know, we have these goals, and we talk about cities in a very sort of smart and elevated way. We talk about livable cities. We talk about sustainable cities. We talk about walkable cities. All those are great goals. But I think we should set the goal even higher. I think the goal should be creating a lovable city, the kind of city that grabs you by the heart and refuses to let you go. That's the kind of city I want to live in. It's the kind of city I know you guys want to live in. That is the kind of city that has to be built in a very different way, and it has to be built together. And hopefully tonight, we've maybe planted a few seeds, got you guys thinking. It's like share some things you love about this place. Get engaged. Do something, a small thing, something that amuses you. It could be fun. It could be weird. I hope it is weird uh, there as well. I saw a velociraptor in, somebody, in one of the neighborhoods today because this guy loves Halloween. But he puts a velociraptor out there. I thought that was amazing. I took a picture of that. It's already on Facebook. So there you go. So city building, you know, community building can be all kinds of stuff. Let's not think about it in sort of one bucket as somebody else's job. When all of us get in this, then it gets really interesting, and then it gets really, really fun. So thank you guys very much for the opportunity to come and talk with you. I understand we want to do a few questions and answers. I'd be happy to answer some of your questions, and maybe we'll go have a drink, and I'll, I'll sign some books for you. Uh, but yeah, if you've got any questions, thank you very much. I'm told I can do the cool bar stool sit thing, so yeah, all right. We have some mics, there we go. There we go. We have some mics so we can run around to make sure we can hear the questions. Okay, what do we got? By the way, I love this campaign. 
there. Uh, welcome, Raleigh. Uh, well done there. So. Thank you. Okay. No questions at all? Is everybody just so excited? <laughs> There's one up there. Microphone coming behind you. There you go. Will you be taking part in any of the uh, activities in Raleigh that will be promoting its image? Uh, not officially, no. Uh, but I'll tell you what. Um, here's what you guys can do. I, I, you can tell. I tell stories. I see cool stuff. I relate that. Um, share with me some cool stuff, and you never know. Uh, somewhere down the line, I'm telling a story. It's like, hey, uh, by the way, this thing in Raleigh, um, I saw that that could be one way uh, to do it. That I will, I will do my part. You share some cool stuff with me, I will pay it forward by sharing some of that stuff uh, elsewhere into the greater world. But you know what? Um, all, all of you are probably better you know, champions for you know, Raleigh's image. I mean, you have friends, you have family, you're connected on social media. Put up cool stuff. When you see it, take a photo, take something. Oh, and so, uh, somebody does a, a, something really kind of interesting, a good story uh, that maybe isn't getting enough play. Don't rely on somebody else to do that. Maybe you can help share that as well. And, then, and becoming from somebody you know, it's actually much more meaningful uh, as well. She's pointing at her friends like, she's got a question. <laughs> OK, I've got to formulate this because she put me on the spot. Um, so Dix Park is a really huge, as you said, right. multi-generational project. Yes. Um, I serve on the advisory uh, committee for that, which okay. I'm really excited about. And we've got quite a diverse group on that committee. Um, but uh, we have our first community meeting coming up uh, on the 16th. Okay. And um, I, how would you suggest um, how we explain the benefits and the really cool things that we could do with Dix Park mm -hmm. to the broader audience, the broader city that's also very diverse, when um, we're still kind of getting ideas and everything right. for the actual like, yeah. vision of it, because it's going to take a long time for us to, to know exactly what it looks like. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. Um, here's the challenge with those types of meetings. Um, we ask our fellow citizens, we do those, the charrettes, these focus groups, and all this kind of stuff. We ask them, what do you think? That's fine. Um, and then our citizens, you guys, are going to try to figure out, OK, how do I artic articulate this? Because they go, I'm not a planner. I'm not a designer. I'm not this. I'm not that. I think we asked the wrong question. So here would be my suggestion for you guys. Instead of asking folks what they think, and I'm sure people will have lots of ideas. We should do this. We should do that. It's like, OK, fine. Ask them what they want to feel. What do you want to feel when you come into this place? I want to feel, I want to feel inspired. I want to feel fun. I want to feel connected to nature. It's like, OK. And then, you know, the folks in the design center, Leslie's group, the folks who sort of uh, brought me here and sort of organized this, you tell them what you want to feel in a space, these folks know how to design that. But, you know, you, if you try to articulate, well, I want to be in a walkable city and I want the dimensions of the sidewalks to be, you know, less than this space because, you know, the area, the ratio in this, people don't know that stuff. They just know, you know what, I want to walk down the street. I want to feel safe. I want to feel like something interesting is going on. I want to walk into that park and I want to feel like, Ah, this is like this is the lungs of our city. It's this is a place where I go. As cool as downtown is, and all those high rises, this is where I go to feel like I'm connected with something different. I can see that and I feel that, but here I want to feel something different. So if you ask folks what do they want to feel, you'll get some interesting answers. And I think people are probably a little more uh, on no, not dishonest. They're not dishonest when they tell you that, but they're trying to speak a language that they don't really. It's like a second language. Like I'm trying to explain to you how I, how I, what I'm thinking in French. It's like my high school French is not that good. But you ask them how they, what they want to feel. It's like, well, I want to feel this. And then smart designers, they can figure that out. And then you can program around that. So that'd be a good question to add to the mix. I'm just um, wondering. How do we reach across barriers of class and yeah. any ideas? You know, just to include. If I had that solution, ma'am, I would be a very rich man because there is no one solution to that. But it, you know, the the start of it is, hey, look, we got to ask that question. And by asking the question, we're recognizing that it is already that it is a problem. And a lot of times, you know, we'll say, hey, um, when we we had this uh, we had this this community meeting, well, we invited those folks and they didn't come. 
And that's sort of the, the fallback thing is here's the thing is uh, communities that have been sort of on the outside looking in, disenfranchised, neglected, and whatnot, you literally, it's not just like, hey, we invited them, they didn't come in. You need to find the people in there, the, the folks who are sort of the ambassadors, the ones who go in there. You need to literally walk and say, hey, you know what? I'm bringing you to a meeting. Come with me. I want you to walk, come here, and we're going to go, some, you're going to see something cool. And it's on us to literally grab folks. You know, put your arm around them, walk them into those kinds uh, of situations. Because it's not just enough to ask them and say, hey, we posted a notice. They didn't show up. So, you know, say, they must not care. No, it's like they felt like they've never been in, you know, you've invited us, but you really haven't invited us. You know, it's that sort of, oh, yeah, you're welcome to come. No, literally, all, I, I think it's on us to, all, to, to, to make it, that's, that's our job. I'm going to bring a buddy. I'm going to bring a buddy from, you know, the other side of town or someplace that maybe that they didn't feel like they were part of. So maybe that's something that we can all do. And that starts changing the equation. And they go, hey, you know, that was actually pretty cool. And then all of a sudden now, maybe it's just a little bit easier the next time. So yeah, grab, everybody bring a buddy. That, that's my solution there. Uh, for social, social equity and equality, bring a buddy. So yeah, there you go. All right, one more quick question. Yes. So I was fortunate to live in Boston, and they had this terrible interstate cutting their city in half and they put an emerald necklace of parks, and that thing was used yes. every second. And it, they had artists that came and put up design for two weeks. They had bigger name artists that put big nets over the city and mm -hmm. sheep in Chinatown, but they had farmer's markets, they had handmade crafts all summer, and it was free. Yeah. And it's, you couldn't park there, so everybody came in on the train to come to these things. Ice rink in the winter, we don't have that here, but something that'll bring people there that they don't have to be warned that there's 15 things going on on the Small mall things. and yeah. you can better find parking. Parking is not cheap if you go to the symphony or whatever here. We are working on transportation, right. but we need to uh, make it free if we can. Well, I will say this, and there was a gentleman who I guess came and spoke a few years ago, uh, wrote a very interesting book called The High Price of Free Parking. Um, I get the notion people think parking should be free, but it, honestly, I don't think so. Uh, with all due respect, parking shouldn't be free, uh, especially in downtown cores. And the thing is, like, well, if it's gotta, if they're going to have to pay for parking, they're going to go elsewhere. It's like, well, the solution to that, you make downtown what's happening so freaking interesting and cool, it's like, yeah, I'll pay five bucks or I'll pay a buck to park or something like that. You were from Boston, right? Did, well, then there, there's the new green bikes. There's the walking trails. There are the, the, what, the R line, free. I rode that today. So there are other options, you know, uh, there as well. But the solution to, it's like, somebody says, well, we need to make parking for free. No, you, make the, you need to make something so interesting that people absolutely want to come and they will figure out, you know, over hell and high water, uh, a way to get there. It's like, if I got to pay to park, if I got to ride my bike, I got to ride my skateboard, whatever, I'm getting there. That is, that should be the, the focus as opposed to like, well, how do we make this parking free? Because that's, I think, we're asking the wrong question uh, by doing that. Yeah, most of our cities, you know, northeast, nor northeastern cities definitely have a bit of more uh, uh, of infrastructure around public transportation around that. Um, but every little bit helps. And I, I saw the green bikes today. I think that's really cool, uh, especially the fact that they're not tethered to a station. You know, that's, that's great stuff. So I hope you guys will take uh, uh, note of the, uh, the challenge there to find something you love about uh, the city. Share it uh, there. Leslie tells me there will maybe be some gift cards, a few other uh, rewards. But the reward should be you're going to see some cool stuff. Uh, and other people can say, hey, you know, I, I love that, uh, uh, that too. And again, it's got to be on us. You know, the, the city and the folks who are behind all this stuff, they're working hard. Um, the challenge is, what can we do? You know, they, there can't be, there's not a parity of power in all this. Because again, you guys can't build roads and bridges and schools. But there has to be a parity of caring. Both, si both of us, we got to all give a damn uh, about uh, the future of, of our city. And, you know, figure out what we can do to be part of the solution as opposed to sitting back and waiting for maybe somebody else to, to make it better for us. So, all right. Join me in thanking Peter. All right. Thank you, guys.